Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship at New Church. You guys doing okay? Good. Good. Um, if we don't stop each week and take the time to align our hearts and align our minds and remind ourselves to be thankful to God, to praise God from whom all blessings flow, then it's not going to be long before we start living as though there's not a God. And it's not just us. I mean, this is the way it's been like since the beginning of time. The problem with missing church is pretty soon we won't. What's happening in this room here this morning is the most important thing in the world. We are tuning our souls. We're aligning ourselves for reality. This is where life is where we find it to have meaning and hope. This is where those things begin is in worship. So I'm glad that you guys are here this morning. Let's read this verse together. 2 Timothy 3.16. We're going to have some blanks this morning. <laughs> All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray as we get started. Father in heaven, we thank you that you promise to be here with us where two or three are gathered in your name. We thank you that you have given us this place where we can gather together as a, as a church, as a spiritual family, as your body, as your people. So we pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds so that we can receive what you have for us this morning, that you would comfort us, that you would challenge us, that you would inspire us. We thank you for this church. I thank you for my friends who are here. And we begin in Jesus' name. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And we continue in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God. Let's stand up and sing.
Lord of all creation Water, earth, and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy, holy The universe declares your majesty You are holy you have been our home before the mountains were born before you gave birth to the earth and the world from beginning to end you are God you turn people back to dust saying return to dust you mortals for you a thousand years are as a passing day as brief as a few hours a few night hours you sweep people away like dreams that disappear they are like grass that springs up in the morning in the mornings it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. We wither beneath your anger. 
We are overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, our secret sins, and you see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath, ending our years with a groan. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you, de you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. O oh Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. Let us, your servants, see your work again. Let our children see your glory. And may the Lord of our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from him and we give him only what he first gave us. First Chronicles 29:14. Good morning, I'm Frank. Glad to see everybody here. This is a time when those of us who call new home uh, give back a portion of what God has given as our weekly worship. We believe everything we have comes from the Lord and he blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. Your faithful giving is what makes it possible for new church to continue doing this ministry. So thank you. 
Uh, the first $100 of our offering today will go to the Hope Impacts, a local ministry helping the hopeless, homeless get off the streets. So let us pray. Mighty Father, it is with grateful hearts that we give back to you, Mighty King, what you have blessed us with. Please take it, Father, as an act of worship and make it go as far as you need it to do. Let it be with joyful hearts and thanksgiving that we do this, Lord, that we might see your mighty hands in action. We love you and bless you and thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen. It's easy to give from your computer or your smartphone by going to newchurch.love slash give, or you can also give by texting the word give to 832-400-5299. The first time we'll ask for your info, but after you're set up, all you have to do is text right back to that same number. Uh, if you're a guest in person or online, uh, please let us know that you are here and so how we can be praying for you by filling out a guest card at newchurch.love slash info. As of right now, it's time for young ones. Please follow Miss Kayla to your class, Angel, and have fun. Morning again. All right, you guys get a chance to read through Genesis a little bit this week? Yeah, some of it. So I, I know that like Kim was cramming trying to get the whole thing in, and I heard that a couple other people were too, so I know that there were some attempts, so I appreciate that. We're in this series where we're going through um, looking at individual books of the Bible and trying to make some sense out of how they fit into the context of the whole scripture, and uh, it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun. Let's pray as we get started. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to gather around your word. Enlighten us today. Show us what you would have us to see and to, you promise that your word never returns to you void. So we trust that you will give us what we need from you today to change us and to make us more like the people you've called us to be. Amen. Okay, I need you to imagine something. Imagine that you grew up as a nomad in a traveling caravan. Your earliest memories are of gazing into a mysterious glowing cloud that was there in the center of camp every day. And at night, it was more like a burning ball of fire and you've never known anything else. Every day you help your mom and dad gather up sweet angel bread that just falls from heaven. It's your main food, except for Saturday, because there's no magic bread on Saturday, never has been. Somehow this is the only day that leftovers don't go bad. But Saturday usually has a meal with wine and roasted meat. You go to worship with your family and your friends. And then every now and then, the leader, a guy named Moses, he says it's time to strike camp, put everything away. And then the entire community, about a million people with all their livestock and all their belongings, all their possessions, they follow that cloud by day and the fireball by night until it stops in a new location. Your parents and your grandparents, they tell stories about how they used to be slaves in Egypt back before God sent Moses to rescue them. They tell other stories too. But all you've ever known 
is camping in the wilderness, following the presence of God, who miraculously feeds you with manna from heaven. Now see, that is the setting for the book of Genesis. Moses wrote this book so all those people could know who they were, who their God is, where the world came from, why it's so broken, why it's important that they not only have faith in God, but they're also faithful. And most importantly, to give them hope that God is going to fix everything and that this life, it's all going somewhere good. So Moses starts his book, the most famous book that will ever be written. He starts it with these words, in the beginning, God. He makes no attempt to prove that God exists. He just states it. I mean, the people that he's writing this for, they experience God's presence every day in like very profound ways. There's no proof necessary for them. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That same God who feeds them every day, who they follow by cloud and by fire, that God made the entire universe. So he talks about the six days of creation, creation of light and dark and time, the sky, the sea, the land, plants, birds and fish and animals. And then finally, mankind, who he made in his own image. Did all that in six days. Now, were these literal 24-hour days? The most obvious meaning of the text would say yes. Could God have stretched those days into eons? Could it mean that? Sure. But why would he have to? I mean, maybe because the world seems to be older than that to us? Well, think about this. If God created a rock, like a gemstone, just by speaking it into existence, he just created a perfect rock. How old would that rock be the moment it was created? It would be now old. Like less than a second old. But what would it look like to us? How old would it appear to be to us? I mean, God is the creator of time, too. So instantaneous creation, that kind of makes sense to me. But if you need to think that the universe is actually billions of years old, maybe so you can hang out with the cool kids when you go to the Museum of Natural History, that's fine. You can believe that God took billions of years to speak the universe into existence if you want to. But if you do, I want you to consider this. God says that death is a result of the fall. There was no death before Adam and Eve disobeyed God. So however it is that you make creation work in your theology, please believe that God is telling the truth and anyone who questions him or contradicts him is wrong. God created a perfect world, however long it took him. And then mankind said they sinned and they corrupted it and they brought death and pain and sorrow into that perfect creation. Which means that Darwinian evolution is completely incompatible with scripture because it relies on death to be the process over time to facilitate evolving. Just consider that. I find it much easier just to believe the plain reading of the text. God created the universe in six literal days. He's God. I mean, to me, the real question would be, why would it take him so long? So right after God made Adam and Eve, he blessed them. And he said this. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. 
rain over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Those are the things that God wants his people to be busy doing. So think about this. How many schemes and tricks of the devil are designed to specifically target that original blessing and those original marching orders? I mean, if the idea is to fill the world with people who are governed by God's commandments, by his love and his goodness and his truth, then what would be the kind of things that would keep people from being fruitful and multiplying? Maybe sacrificing their children? Maybe having sex outside of marriage? Maybe teaching lies as if they're truth? Distortion of gender identity? Governing in ways that are contrary to God's word? Like being irresponsible and destroying the planet for a cash grab? Notice that half this command has to do with taking care of the earth and taking care of all the creatures that he put on it. So the children of Israel, they were about to go into the promised land and they were going to be tempted to do all those things wrong, just like we are. So they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve, and they sinned. They disobeyed God. We call that the fall. After the fall, God told the man and woman that life was going to be full of pain and trouble and death. That was the bad news. But he also said this, and he said this to the devil, to the serpent. He said, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now that is known as the first gospel. The devil is cursed. One day a son of Eve will crush his head, but that son will be wounded in the process. Implication mortally wounded. And we read this, we read this knowing that ultimately it's going to be Jesus who defeats Satan by the cross and the resurrection. Eve didn't think she was going to have to wait quite that long though. She was pretty sure it was going to be her firstborn son Cain who would rise up and save them. Now all those children of Israel that Moses is writing this book for they probably figured God was preparing them to crush the heads of all the wicked devil worshipers, all those evil people that surrounded them everywhere they went. So, right now, I'm about a third of the way through this sermon, and I'm still in the third chapter of Genesis. <laughs> there is so much in this book. Every sermon could go back to the Garden of Eden, every single sermon. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, they tell half the history of the world. Creation, the fall, Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden. Eve has her first son and her second son. And things don't go very well at all for the first family. The older brother kills the younger brother in a jealous rage. There's the beginning of cities and industry and art. I mean, there's so many awesome wild and wonderful stories in those first 11 chapters of Genesis. I'm barely going to touch on them this morning. But the world becomes filled with evil and wickedness and demonic worship. And there comes a day when God sees that there's only one pure and blameless man left on the whole earth. There's only one man who walked in close fellowship with God. Chapter 6, verse 11. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world 
for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I've decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. And he told Noah to build an ark, big boat. He told him to save a breeding pair of each species of land animals. When the ark was finished, Noah and his family, along with the pairs of living creatures, they all got inside the ark. God shut the door. And then he flooded the world, basically starting over, baptized the whole world. And then after the flood, he gave Noah that same blessing and those same marching orders that he had given Adam about being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. But he added this line. He said, and I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. Then he made a rainbow as a sign of that new promise. And if you think of it like a bow, like, like a bow and arrow, Notice he pointed it at himself, which Christians have always seen as a reference to the Son of God giving his life to satisfy that requirement of blood. So the world repopulated. In chapter 11, they try to build a tower to heaven. They have all kinds of bad ideas. So God confuses all the people's languages and he scatters them all over the world. This is the Tower of Babel story. And then we have the second part of the book of Genesis, where God chooses one man to bless that one man so that his descendants would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This is going to be that specific family that the son of Eve is going to come through. His name was Abram later changed to Abraham. God said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. God promised that all of Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. He said, your descendants will become many nations. Kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Now remember, Moses is telling this to the very numerous descendants of Abraham. So this is who they were. Abraham was a nomad just like them. He even traveled through a lot of the same areas that they've been traveling. And this promised land that they were about to enter, that was Canaan. So one day, God and a couple of angels, they show up and they have lunch with Abraham. God wants to warn Abraham about what, about what he was about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah, which was going to envire some fire and some brimstone and a really bad day. So Abraham tries to talk God out of that. But God says, I would save it if there was anyone there worth saving. Sounds kind of harsh. The two angels, they went down to Sodom to warn Abraham's nephew, his name was Lot. It says all the men of the city tried to rape them. Mm -hmm. Not a great move, Sodom. This is where sodomy gets its name, by the way. So Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Now, it was going to be 25 years before Abraham's son Isaac is born. 25 years. And then... God was going to tell him to sacrifice his son to prove his faithfulness. And Abraham was going to do it too. But God doesn't let him go through with it. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Lots of family drama between those two. Jacob, whose name actually means the deceiver, he tricked his brother out of his birthright. 
so that he would get all the rights of being the firstborn. But then Jacob, he ends up getting tricked into spending half his life as an indentured slave to the father of the two women that he took as his wives. As we continue going through Genesis, Jacob has 12 sons. And then one strange night, God comes to Jacob as a man to talk. It's probably the pre-incarnate Jesus. And Jacob gets in a fight with him. He says, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. And God's like, hmm, that's cute. And he touches Jacob's hip and wrenches it out of socket. And Jacob walks with a limp for the rest of his life. But God says, okay, but here's your blessing. Listen, Jacob the deceiver, from now on, your name will be Israel, which means wrestles with God. Because you have fought with God and you've fought with men and you've won. So those 12 sons of Jacob, who's now called Israel, these would be the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel. And like I said, this is Moses telling the children of Israel where they came from, who they were. But there's one more big question that needs to be answered for them. How did the children of Abraham end up being slaves in Egypt? So the last third of the book of Genesis is that story. It's the story of Joseph, the next to last son of Jacob. And Joseph was his favorite. He didn't even try to hide it either. Joseph flaunted his special favor and status in front of his brothers. He told them about his dreams where he was in charge of all of them and they had to bow down to him. And they got jealous and they planned to kill him. But at the last minute, they had second thoughts and they sold him to some slave traders instead. It was actually his brother Judah's idea not to kill Joseph. So they told their dad dad that Joseph was killed by wild animals. So Joseph was taken to Egypt. He was sold to the captain of the palace, the head of security for Pharaoh. And God is with Joseph. He becomes the captain's personal assistant, put in charge of his whole house. But he ends up falsely accused of sleeping with the boss's wife. He gets thrown in jail. And when he's in jail, he meets a couple of Pharaoh's servants who had gotten in trouble for some reason. And then Joseph interprets some dreams for them. When those guys get out of jail, one day Pharaoh, he has this disturbing dream. He can't figure out what it means. And one of those servants remembers his prison buddy, Joseph. So long story short, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. They're about a famine that's coming. And again, because God is with Joseph... Pharaoh ends up making him his trusted right-hand man. Joseph has a plan for how they're going to get through this famine. So when the famine hits and everyone outside of Egypt is starving, old man Jacob sends his sons to Egypt to buy some food. And lo and behold, when they get there, they find their brother Joseph in charge. So they bow down to him, just like the dream. (laughs) It's a pretty cool moment. Joseph forgives his brothers. He moves the whole family to Egypt, takes care of them. And the book ends by telling us that Joseph lived to be 110 years old, and he was buried like an Egyptian king. It's a happy ending. But of course, Moses is telling this story to the children of Israel, whose ancestors had been slaves in Egypt for at least a couple hundred years. But at least now they know how they got there. So that was a quick sprint through Genesis. Of course, we don't close the Bible, though, until we see how it points to Jesus, right? So where is Jesus in the book of Genesis? And the truth is, man, he's all over it. I've already mentioned a couple places, but there's so many more. Genesis is just full of references to Jesus 
He was there at creation. He was promised to Eve. He met with Abraham. He wrestled with Jacob. He's foreshadowed by Adam, the tree of life, Abel, the ark, the almost sacrifice of Isaac, the life of Joseph. There's so many ways that Genesis points to Jesus. But here's a couple of big ones. Before Jacob died, he gathered his 12 sons round him and he blessed them. And as Christians, we're particularly interested in the blessing that he gave to Judah, which was the brother that spared Joseph's life, because we know that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And this is where we first learn about that. Jacob says this to Judah. He says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you, Judah. My son is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the colt of his donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who will will reign forever, the one that all nations will honor. And here's one more, and this is one that most people tend to miss, because most people don't usually read the Bible in its original language of Hebrew. This one gives me the chills. It's so cool. Look at this. We're looking at the English and then the Hebrews underneath it. And it says, in the beginning, God created untranslated word, the heavens and untranslated word, the earth. Now, what are those untranslated words? Well, both of them, untranslated words, they're the same word. The Aleph Tav, which are the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It's like when we say from A to Z, from first to last, from beginning to end. (laughs) This is Moses telling the children of Israel and all of us that in the beginning, God created everything from A to Z, the heavens and the earth from A to Z. Things might look bad sometimes. Things might look really dark and scary sometimes. But God says, I got this. Trust me. I have a plan. This untranslated word, it shows up a whole bunch of other places in the Bible too. Like at the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Jerusalem, all kinds of places where things seem really dark and really scary. So Genesis is the first book of the Christian Bible. Let's jump to the last book. In Revelation 22, 13, Jesus is talking about himself. And this is what he says. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Jesus is hidden right there in the first line of the Bible. How's that for some divinely inspired bookends? I think God is telling us the same thing he was telling the children of Israel. He's saying that he's got this. You're going to face some terrifying things in this life. You're going to be tempted to give in to your fears. You're going to be tempted to think that God is either not paying attention or he doesn't care about you. Well, don't give up. Don't lose your faith. Stay faithful. Remember who you are 
Remember where you came from. Remember who your God is. He's the God who created everything from Aleph to Tav, from A to Z, from beginning to end. He's Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. There's this great line at the end of Joseph's story when he's talking to his brothers and forgiving them. He says, what you intended for evil, God intended it all for good. This is all going somewhere good. It started in a garden paradise and it's going to end in a garden paradise. Trust in God. This is only the beginning. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. A lot of us are familiar with Genesis, but sometimes we forget to see how that points to your son and our salvation and the promises that you've given your people, created in your image and restored by Jesus. Help us to trust you. Renew our faith. Remind us to be faithful. We thank you for this. In the name of the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Amen. Let's stand and sing about our faith. confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. His ends are attached, as Frank has pointed out, to his beginnings. And this is why we can have confidence that if we ask him things according to his will, that they 
will happen. He's created everything, including time and your history and mine. And if we ask him things that are in accordance with his will, he will come through. It might not always be what you want or I want, but it will always be good and it will always be the best. And he generally will answer us. We should keep that in mind in the days and the weeks to come. We have to trust God with our history, but he is a loving father and he listens to the cries of his children. Let's pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Lord, we ask that you will hear us as we lift up these petitions to you today. All the petitions we have, O oh Lord, we offer to you through Christ and ask that you would hear us. Lord, we pray for the various needs of the church. We lift up those who are sick or facing medical procedures, who are facing bereavement. Uh, we lift up to you Charles and Rick and Ray and Kent and Clifford and Bill and Michelle and Wayne and Brooke and Grace and Brian and Pat, Eli and Mary Lou and Sarah, the Pars and the Cummins. We lift up to you those who are having relationship problems, Lord, and ask that you would uh, knit them together. For those who are, need a job or who are facing financial challenges, we pray that you will provide for your people as you always have. For those who are depressed or tired or sad, we ask that you would yourself be the restoration of joy. We lift up to you, Texas and the United States and our leaders and ask, O oh Lord, that your gospel would speak truth there and that our nation and our state would become lights for all the nations and that they would see and hear. We continue to pray for our ministry partner, Hope Impacts, we pray for new church, Lord, and for your church throughout the world, that we would be faithful in the mission that you've called us to do. If there's anybody here this morning who has not repented of their sin and confessed their need of a savior and have not believed on Jesus' name, Lord, we ask that they would hear the gospel today, turn away from death and walk in faith and new life. Lord, in your mercy, for our prayer. Now let us pray as our Lord Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. Grant you his favor. Give you his peace. May he pour his grace upon you. Yeah.
face upon you, grant you his favor, give you very much for joining us for worship today if you could have a seat we just have a couple of quick announcements y'all like the today's service good deal like lynn says man uh seeing all you guys really brings joy i I am very spoiled to get to have this uh honor here and just i love seeing you guys and all your faces so know that you're loved um please uh thank you for joining us this week we have a couple um announcements so next week or i'm sorry on february 21st is our annual voters meeting it will be immediately after worship so please hang tight for that Uh, on the agenda will be to approve the proposed budget for the upcoming year please check your newsletter so you know what it's going to entail and be ready to go Um, reminder that kemper's new church revolution bible study will be this afternoon it is via zoom at five o'clock the link is set up at newchurch.com dot love slash events Uh, we will always stream a raw feed of today's service Uh, there will be an edited version that goes out this afternoon around five o'clock maybe the lord spoke to you this morning you'll want to share it with somebody you thought of during the sermon You can find it at newchurch.love. As always, it's always wonderful to see everybody. Uh, We would ask help putting up all this gear. If you could find Ed or Valentin, many hands make light the work. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I I learned something new at Genesis, uh, the beginning and the end. That was pretty cool. I mean, the Lord gives us little nuggets. Hold on to them. My challenge to you is in the book of Exodus this week. It should take you about three hours to read it. It's about 30 minutes a day. I'm going to challenge you and ask that you read it because I might just come up and ask you, tell me something new you learned about Exodus that you didn't know before. I'm always going to dig. Don't be put on the spot. Come find me. Tell me something cool you learned about the book of Exodus. Uh, As always, if somebody invites you to lunch, go. Show the world what it is to be the body of Christ. We love you guys. We thank you for coming, and I hope you'll have a good week.